Hello! This is going to be a very quick January-February reading wrap-up because I want to get back into doing more book videos and so I am going to do them every two months this year like I normally have done in the past. Last year I just did it weirdly for some reason. So I am going to do that even though I didn't read that many books in the past two months. I read four, <laughs> um, but it'll be a short video and that's okay. So let's get into it. The first book that I read in January was actually a book that I started in December and finished in January, which was The House on the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. This book was a delight to read. It reminded me a lot of Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, that sort of vibe, although perhaps less spooky than that. Uh, the, I mean, can you say it's less spooky when one of the characters is literally the Antichrist? But also, Lucy is adorable, so powerful and could be terrifying and is terrifying, but also is a six-year-old boy who is just trying to live his life. <laughs> this is the story of a uh, an alternate universe, an alternate earth where people with powers exist, children with powers exist. I don't actually remember what they call them in this world. Do they call them gifted? It's quite possible that they call them gifted, I do not remember, but anyway, um, it is about this world where people exist who have powers, and when they are children they are put into homes for children with powers until they can be sent to schools for children, schools for children with powers, and then they go into the adult world and nobody knows what happens after that. Nobody in the regular mundane uh, society knows what happens and everyone thinks that it's just fine. Um, and the story follows the main character is a caseworker for basically the children's aid organization in like America, I guess. I think it's in the United States. Anyway, he's a caseworker who is uh, very low level and cares very much about um, the children's well-being and is always very careful about uh, his inv investigations of different homes and making sure the children are well treated and all of that and he is one of very few caseworkers and very few people in this organization who actually do care about the children but he's also really really good at his job so he gets um, basically promoted and given a like a top secret job to go and visit the house in the Cerulean Sea which is a uh, closed off home for children with the most dangerous powers, or I guess children who were shunted from home to home and did not fit in any of the homes and ended up at the last possible place they could go, which happens to be a home that is actually run by a gifted adult, which honestly is how all of the homes should be run. That is the system that you need to go with. But anyway, it is the story of Linus, Linus Baker, I believe is his last name, uh, to this island where he knows absolutely nothing about what's going on there to investigate whether the house is being run properly, whether the home is being run pro properly, and also to basically spy on the headmaster of the house because people with magical gifts are not trusted in regular society um, and are mistreated. And it is the story of him doing his investigation but also growing closer with the members of that home the children endearing themselves to him, and also him uh, dealing internally with the feelings that he realizes he has developed for Arthur Parnassus, the headmaster of the home. The story is really well crafted. The characters are absolutely delightful to read. The world building is has a very, like, the least negative connotations you can possibly think of, but Harry Potter style in terms of the way things are named, the types of character names, the way the magic is described, just the general like vibe of the world feels like that to me, but it's so much more well thought out, <laughs> if that makes sense. The whole story is about Linus being disillusioned and recognizing that the place he works for is actually really corrupted, really corrupt and bad for the children that he cares about. That is all I want to say about it without spoiling anything, but it is a wonderful book and if any of the things I've said about it sound interesting, you should check it out. It's also a really easy read, it's not like, there's intense stuff that happens in it, but it's not a heavy read and it's not a, a dense read or anything, it's just, it's a fun read. The next book that I read in January was The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. I have not read a book by Erin Morgenstern since I read the has she written other books since The Night Circus? 
Well, anyway, I haven't read anything since I've read the night since I read the Night Circus, which was like seven years ago, eight years ago, a while ago, which was a book that I really, really loved the concept of, really, really loved the writing of. Everything about it was wonderful, except the forced hetero romance, which was so boring and unnecessary, and that's why I didn't like that book as much as I could have and was very frustrated with it. But The Starless Sea has a gay main character, and the concept is just like written for me. It just feels like it's written for me. A vast, mysterious, magical library hidden deep beneath the earth that you get to through magical doorways throughout your life, and it's full of artists and scholars living their lives and having adventures and and preserving knowledge and stories and storytelling being so important in all the different and in, in all of its different different forms and that world being under threat by people who specifically are claiming to want to protect it and preserve it and in doing that are actually threatening it is kind of the overall arching plot of the story. The world that Aaron Morgan Stern builds in this book is it's just beautiful. The writing is gorgeous. The characters, I love them. The relationships are so complicated. The way that flashbacks are told and stories from within the library are um, interwoven with the main plot of the story and how it all comes to a head without you expecting it, but it's also all foreshadowed with prophecies and bits of prophecies and little hints throughout until everything comes into a crescendo of disaster at the end and and then it, like satisfying conclusion and <laughs> I feel like I sound like I'm fangirling a little bit and maybe I am because I really really enjoyed this book like partway through I was just like oh my god this is going to be a good book I'm going to read 10 more times in my life at the very least it's just a book that it's just it's just a book for me that's all I have to say everything about it is has Adela written all over it so <laughs> anyway those were all the books that I finished in January the first book that I read in February I think I actually started it in January anyway finished it in February it took me a long time to read but that was Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne Jones uh, probably don't have to explain the story of this one given that everyone knows the Ghibli movie funny thing with this story is the movie of Howl's Moving Castle does a weird thing with my brain. I have seen it now three times, and every single time I watch that movie, I forget everything that has happened to it. Not a single thing. I forget the entire story, I forget the characters' names, I forget what everyone looks like. It's just gone from my head. I don't know why. That doesn't happen to me with any other movies. <laughs> anyway, that's not really relevant, but um, I read the book, and um, it is quite different from the movie story, and I read some crit critiques actually of the movie recently online from people who really really enjoy the actual plot of the book and the underlying plots of the family stuff and the relationship, the relationship that has more ups and downs and is more complicated than it is shown as in the movie. Um, and I, t I think those, th those critiques are valid. I still think the movie is fun and beautiful. In its own right, um, and I don't have probably because I saw the movie first. I don't have the attachment to it to the book that other people do, um, but I enjoyed the book a lot. I had a I had a lot of fun reading it. I really like the way it's. It reminds me of. It's another nostalgic feeling read in a good way. It's another book that reminds me of reading bizarre, quirky, magical adventures that you read as a kid. I don't know if that made any sense, but I enjoyed it. And I liked the things that are in it that are not in the movie, like, wait, wait, that was a big spoiler, never mind. I guess I can't really say the things without being spoilers for the book if you haven't read the book but have just seen the movie. So, well, I'll just say there are more complicated relationship things and more background things going on than there are in the movie, and they are really interesting, and I like them. Okay. And the last book that I have to talk about, which is the last book that I read in February, that I read in one day, which was Woman World by Minder Dalawal. Not sure how to pronounce that first name or that last name, so I apologize for that. Um, but it is Woman World. It is a graphic novel. 
I think I'm going to try to read more graphic novels this year, especially because I've been struggling with reading really slowly, mo mostly because I just have so many other projects going on that I do not have time. But <laughs> I'm going to be reading more graphic novels this year. Uh, anyway, this is, as you can probably guess by the title, a futuristic story of a world where cis men have entirely disappeared from the population. They just stopped being born, basically. Gradually stopped being born until eventually no boys were born anymore. It's a very, like, early feminist idealized world in a basic concept. Uh, the idea that men are the problem in the world and if they were gone then the world would just automatically be a better place. Obviously that is not the case. There are many, many horrible people of all genders and uh, also very, very many good people of all genders, and you can't just um, break it down that simply. Now this book is a lot more inclusive and understanding of these issues than one book, than a book written maybe 50 years ago would be, because there are trans women in it, and there are trans men in it, and they are written in a very thoughtful and Conscientious, conscientious way that makes me think that the author did her research and spoke to a lot of people that would be affected by those perspectives being in the book. It feels like they were genu genuinely uh, written and auth authentically written, if that makes sense, um, which I really appreciated. The only thing I would say is the fact, just the fact that it is called Woman World and that womanhood and femaleness as a concept is a very heavy theme in the book. It does completely exclude um, anyone who is neither male nor female. So anyone who's non-binary or genderqueer is not really um, considered in this world. I, Though there is one character who I wonder about and I wish that it had been more explicit but there is a character called Doctor who is, whose pronouns are never used, and I have a feeling that that character is meant to be non-binary, but I think that it would have been good if it had just been mentioned at one point that they have other pronouns um, or something, <laughs> just to make that more clear. That's the only critique I have. I think it's a very fun story. It's very um, well-written political cartoon style of good jokes about what the world would be like without toxic masculinity and the patriarchy being in power or really there at all. Uh, I said my main critique about it. Also, like I mentioned earlier, the idea that everything would just automatically be better <laughs> if uh, men were gone is... <sighs> it is very idealized and not realistic. But it's not meant to be realistic as far as I don't think. I don't think it's I don't think it's supposed to be like this is what I actually think the world would be like if men didn't exist. I think it's just pointing out the flaws in our current society by showing them discussed in a future society in this way, if that makes sense. Um, and the whole story is told basically from the perspective of this little girl who has grown up in this world, has never seen a world other than this, and is very curious about what the past was like, and kind of the way she is learning about the world that we live in um, through stories that she hears from her grandmother, who is one of the last surviving people from the present day, if that makes sense. And those were all of the books that I read in January and February, so that is all I have to say. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.